Coming live from Sydney, Australia is our guest this morning. Welcome to this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live, the show which ensures that you profit from your time spent here with experts, either through the industry insights, information, or simply learning from them. And today we have Nicole Baldenu, co-founder and CEO of Webinar in Ninja, an independent SaaS company that has served over a million webinar attendees and hosts. He's also co-founder and producer of the $100 MBA show, a best of iTunes podcast with over 100 million downloads. And Nicole is also the co-host of Nicole and Kate Can Relate podcast. Welcome to the show, Nicole. Hi, AJ. Thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Nicole. And we are also very happy to talk to you, to learn about it. Such a great transition from you, from being an educator to an entrepreneur and also a podcast host of two great podcasts, you know, so that will that that there is a lot to talk about. In fact, today we'll be talking about how to manage and grow a remote team because that's very much relevant in today's time, especially in the backdrop of COVID. So, Nicole, first to understand uh, how how do you know so much about remote functioning? Do you yourself use a lot of uh, help from remote teams uh, while, while you are running your operations? Well, we uh, grew as a remote team quite organically. Um, when Omar and I started our business together, it was really just the two of us. Uh, at the time, we were living in New York, so I'm taking us back almost 10 years now, 2013 to New York right. City. We uh, started the $100 MBA program, uh, and then later on, eight months later, we launched the, the podcast. So in the beginning, it was just uh, me and Omar. And then, you know, a year later, not too much later, came Webinar Ninja. And, um, and so, you know, as we started to require help from other team members, we started to hire in a remote fashion because we didn't have an office. Uh, we were working from home. And so it was actually a very organic process. It wasn't like we intentionally decided we are going to be a remote company. I mean, as I said, back in 2012, 2013, there were very few companies that were remote first. Um, there were a couple of companies that we looked up to, like Basecamp, for example, that we now use for our project management. But it, it just wasn't a common thing. So it actually was born out of necessity. And therefore, when you ask me, like, do I know a lot about it? I've learned about it through trial and error, through the process of doing it as we've grown our company. Right. That's why I asked the call, because I knew that, you know, it is when you are building a, a company from starting as an educator and then making that transition, obviously, it's a very obvious thing that you would be taking a lot of help from freelancers, remote workers. And the reason, is, uh, the outcome is that now the world knows that actually you were the early starters uh, with using of remote resources. And that's that's a great thing. And that is why you uh, become a master for us today, uh, because you they know things from the ground and much, much before than the world has actually seen uh, in the last two years. And what better to learn and from whom better to learn than from an entrepreneur who has who knows about the nuts and bolts of the system, nuts and bolts about entrepreneurship, and nuts and bolts about remote working. So we'll be asking about how exactly one can manage and grow a remote team. And that is now we know how you have built it up. So in terms of a remote working uh, team, uh, Nicole, when an entrepreneur builds a business, now if it's a big company, they know that they can get resources from anywhere and there is a team to handle those resources but a lot of uh, freelancers are using freelancers mm -hmm. a lot of small businesses are using uh, freelancers remote workers and a lot of larger companies are also using uh, resources from across the world because that's the world uh, of today how does one uh, manage it so firstly to know about uh, to manage about these things, it's better to know about the challenges. Hmm. So what are the challenges that generally come when you are hiring uh, remote workers 
a remote team, and especially if you are a small organization, your whole life depends on those people. How do mm. you work things around? I have asked several things at the same time <laughs> yeah. so that you can respond at your own pace. Um, yeah, no, sure. And, these, and it's such a great question because, and I think it's great that you ask and we start with challenges because I think, you know, sharing those challenges can be very helpful. And so for sure there are challenges. No one says that it's absolutely, you know, easy, um, you know, out the gate. So happy to talk about those. Uh, the, the first, obviously, the one that comes to mind, which, is, you know, most people would imagine is an obvious one, is the time zone challenge. So, you know, getting over that hurdle, you know, maybe if it's your first hire, if you're a company that's a small company and you're starting to consider, you know, bringing in and building a remote team, then perhaps, you know, an easy way to mitigate the time zone challenge is to begin hiring people that are in a similar time zone where you have enough daylight hours that you overlap. Um, our company now, you know, with it's eight years now that we've been in operation, we are spread across nine different time zones. So for sure that challenge is still very real, but you know, we make it work. Um, and, you know, because we're a team that likes to consider like one of our values is that team player spirit. We like to consider each other and how our, you know, the, for example, when we have, when we schedule meetings, uh, we like to rotate, for example, the, company all hands the one that we do once a month so that you know everybody can join at a different time that it's uh, more convenient so little you can do little things like that to get over the time zone challenge but that's definitely one of them but it's certainly something that can be right. can be resolved uh, there is the cultural differences too and you know that is something that uh you know it's a part of getting to know and it's actually a really interesting part of having a remote team which I actually think turns into a positive because as soon as you start to have team members from all around the world you start to have a product that's informed with a much more global perspective and I think that that is a huge contribution and a huge value when you're building a product that you're able to have a product that has you know uh, this multicultural uh, perspective, uh, you know, informed and placed on it. So I think while it's like maybe a little bit of a disadvantage, you start to get to know uh, different people from different cultures and you start maybe you need to overcome some hurdles of maybe communication, um, whatever it might be, it can always turn into a positive. And similar to with the time zone challenge, basically if you do have teammates all around, uh, you know, at different time zones, there's always somebody on whether it's your support team whether it's team members who are working at different times they always have somebody on the team that they can reach out to talk to and not feel so isolated so maybe i'm not really answering them as straight up challenges because there is a positive spin to them but they can be challenges for sure and i right, think right. and this i think the, yeah no sorry go ahead yeah this is fine these are great uh, inputs you know because some things may look very obvious, but you never know about them. You never even notice them. You don't talk about them. And time zone is such a great, uh, great thing to talk about because it is indeed an opportunity as well as a challenge. And that is where uh, for a business, it's important to manage that part of it. And also about, you know, uh, the other thing that you talked about. Yeah, sure. The cultural differences. I think, you know, in all of these things, um, I would say probably the number one thing that you need to be mindful of is your communication, how much right. you you communicate. And it goes without saying that you need to over communicate because it's, even with dealing with all of these challenges, it's all really about managing expectations. So if we're talking about um, time zones, for example, then it's a, it me and perhaps there's a meeting that is at a different time for someone else um, on the team, then it's all, all about over communicating, making sure that, you know, they have the tools, whether it's their calendars set up properly that are synced, whether it's, you know, setting alarms, these basic little reminders that your, you know, your teammates will appreciate because it makes sure that they won't miss meetings but again you have to be mindful as the leader to make sure you you remind people you communicate um and, and basically like over communicate so that people do feel like they can show up they don't make mistakes um and and they're set up for success really right right because now in terms of you know getting the right resources uh, if you are a small business or a one or two person team who is uh, building up a company, mm -hmm. you have a certain degree of limitation. 
and then you also are not a trained person who knows about what a great recruiter would know or about mm -hmm. an hr person would know because they have so many years of experience and your yes. mind is fully focused on building your business yes then how do you hire a person what have you learned through this process how do you hire the right person because you see a lot of freelancers or independent resources they are great they are very talented mm -hmm. but they are also attuned to a certain degree of mindset of independence mm -hmm. independent working and the hold that you are con not control but in a direct communication that you have with an employee is different here the person may just may, may not be as professional as you start working with them so mm -hmm. that is one that can be a big challenge going forward after you have entered into a relationship so how have you gone through this process what is it that you have relied on most while hiring a resource mm -hmm. is it your intuition is it just you have talked once and you felt good that we should go is it about a certain skill that a person has and you know that that is more important and you can work things around how mm -hmm. does it work uh, with with the person when you are hiring a person or a team at, uh, remotely Oh, AJ, that is that that could be the whole topic of, for an hour discussion together. It's such a great, great question. It's such a great point. It really is. And, you know, I'll tell you that we definitely uh, made lots of mistakes and improved our process over the years because we made mistakes when it came to, and, I, you know, I'll call them mistakes, but they're all learnings, really. Like if I say it's really a learning and it was a way to understand and improve a process. Um, so I'll, I'll th a few things that come to mind is, you know, having that, I think probably in the beginning, we might have had just a single interview and made a decision off a single interview. Well, very quickly, once we realized, well, no, that's probably not the best way to do it. We would have a, a cultural a screening interview first to just have a, a conversation with the candidate to see if they're a good fit for us. And likewise, if we're a good fit for them, because you, you mentioned before, like there are different um requirements when it, when you're expecting somebody to be autonomous flexible they have this autonomy and flexibility because they're they're a remote uh, they, they're not there in a physical office but that requires them to have certain other skills like they have to have the right attitude they have to be right. self-starters they have to right. be people that are self-motivated and so you're not going to get that from one conversation um so that's one of the things that we really, really look for when we're having those first conversations. Um, later on, you know, after we decide, okay, this is great, let's have a second conversation. One of the things we would do, of course, is, um, well, even if I take a step back before that, we do a pre-screening um, Google form where, you know, you can simply do that on Google, it's free, and you can ask your set of questions, all the things that are important to you before you actually decide to get on a call. Like, well, I remember we used to jump on calls and I used to waste so many hours talking to people where I was like, I could have screened them out and filtered them out through just a simple form, uh, you know, an intake form. And now what we've done recently too, which can be, you know, it depends, not all companies might like to do this, but we'll even ask for a video um, introduction. So, because that's really quite important if you expect your teammates to be able to be on camera, on video, when you're having meetings, when you're having your all hands, they have to be comfortable with being on camera. That's one of the minimum requirements. And so you can even screen that out from that intake form before you even have that conversation by asking them to do a video introduction. So in that form, you can actually um, filter out a lot of candidates and save you a lot of time. So that's so if you've got a screening form, you've got your cultural interview. Then on the second interview, because we always do a second interview, that's when you bring in um, the other team members who are on the team that that person is joining. So for example, and again, if we're talking about a very small team, you might not have a customer support manager. So you may get another customer support um, team member to just sit in on the interview because at the end of the day that person has to work with this new new candidate and so you always bring in another team member from the, the department it may not even be the same department depending on how big your team is um, just so that they can have another 
you can have another um, opinion, another person's input on the team um, on this candidate. And I guess I'll finally say that, you know, you are hiring for skill. Um, so definitely a trial project. You know, there's nothing to stop you from setting a, ta a task that's not critical, running through a trial for one month, three months, whatever that, you know, you want to set it at, seeing how that project goes and then deciding to continue the relationship and bring them on, whether it's more permanently or, or full time, whatever the, the situation. Um, so, yeah, those are the, first, the things that come to mind for now, but I'm sure there's plenty more that I've left off. Yes, yes. We are, obviously, uh, you have covered it all, but I'm just talking about the minute thing that a entrepreneur, you have, you are an entrepreneur, you have gone through that process. And, you know, and there are a lot of things that comes to an entrepreneur's mind, and especially, you know, if it's a small business, like, for example, uh, it, it's the time of the great resignation, and a lot of people are living the life yes. that they want. But a lot of people have a very different sort of mindset. Mm -hmm. As an entrepreneur, you may hire one freelancer and everything goes for very nice uh, for a week or two. And suddenly, uh, once you make a call, you find out that the person is in the Amazon forest. And, you know, so yeah. what do you do with that? They have, you have little control over that whole mm -hmm. situation and you have an important client work to do. The person is sticking to his prom to his promise, his or her promise. That yeah. listen, I'm I'm on my work, but mm -hmm. you know, being in a very far off area, or has its own challenges like internet connectivity, uh, and the mindset at that particular time. If one person is in a purely in a very sort of a diff different sort of a mindset, safari mm -hmm. sort of a mindset, mm -hmm. and here you are talking about some critical project, so. How does it? The, that person is also right. You are also right. You have your own requirements. The maximum, if, if things don't go wrong, the person will say, okay, let's, uh, you know, you, uh, I'll go off from here. But you can't do it. You have already a project in hand. How do you manage that part of the thing? Do you tell them that, listen, you got to tell me before you move out of your, of, of your location like you have it uh, in terms of your regular employees? Because things can mm. happen, can you can require at a different. These are you know practical things, and yes. that is why I needed to understand from you who are, who is running such a big company. Yeah. Okay. So the concern that I'm understanding is that um, because I'm sorry, I'm getting an echo. Oh no. The concern that I understood is that because teammates. Uh, remote they can therefore change their location at any time and the risk is maybe they don't inform you maybe they fall out of touch okay uh, it's a good one and it's a it's a valid concern and I think it really comes down to the again it's the expectations that you set at the outset but of course, just because, you know, you might set some expectations at the beginning, you might, um, you know, we, you agree on the hours, the work days, because it could be different days. Some might work on, on different days of the week. Um, you agree on all of those things. You agree on the role description, the project, all of that, all of that stuff. Um, and you agree on things like security because you have to outline all those things, you know, right. logging in, um, logging off, two-factor authentication, all of those things, you know, you stipulate at the outset. Um, I think what happens to some team leaders and it's very small businesses, because of course the leaders are busy, the founders are busy, they're wearing all the hats, they're doing so many things. And so sometimes they might just expect that, okay, I've given those instructions, the person knows what to do, I've told them once, and I can just let them, you know, go off on their own. And they're going to come back to me with the work in two weeks, three weeks, whatever. And that's a big mistake. Because you need to be still communicating with those teammates. And that is, you know, setting the cadence that you want, whether it's a, a daily standup, you know, with engineering, it's common to have a 15 minute daily standup. So you're checking in once a day. So you know where they are. And, and you know, it's that transparency that if you're going to take a flight, if you're going to leave somewhere, you know, they're going, they're going to tell you because they, they will tell you, you know, I can't come tomorrow to tomorrow's standup because I'm actually moving country. Okay, then you can have that conversation if you haven't already. 
in our case, we, we, you know, those conversations we have at the beginning before we hire somebody. Um, so those daily, it could be a daily check-in, it could be a weekly check-in, it could right. be setting a milestone for a project. Because if you tell someone, come back to me in two weeks, it's possible they could take two weeks of vacation and you won't, you won't even know because you never bothered to check in with them. So having like the tools, the right set of tools, um, which we can talk about if you like, where you're able to continue, you know, communicate with your team can prevent something like that happening where all of a sudden somebody has disappeared and you don't hear from them for another three weeks. Okay. Is there any particular, a couple of tools that you can recommend for uh, entrepreneurs, budding entrepreneurs, small uh, small entrepreneurs, small businesses, if there's any particular tool that you would recommend that they can use uh, to communicate with their remote workers and also to know exactly, you know, that everybody's everything is running as per plan. Because nowadays I hear a lot about this asynchronous tools. Asynchronous, yes. Can, yes, yes. And yeah. on, di on different time zones and all. And this is something very interesting. But you tell me from your experience so that people can know more about it. Sure thing. Look, there's a lot of tools out there if you're looking for asynchronous communication tools and project management tools. Um, I can share the experience that I've had, you know, when when we were very small and we didn't need a big project management tool like Basecamp, which I think is a very reasonable price for right. even a small team. Um, you know, I think we, I, you know, I can't even remember what we were using. I, I would imagine we were using things like Skype. Okay. <laughs> this is like back in the day. But, right. you know, then we, you know, we went on to use Slack and Slack, I believe, has a free version. Right. Um, Slack is a great one. Basecamp, Asana. There's a, there's a quite a few asynchronous project management tools, and depending on budget, depending on your team size, um, you know you, you're going to be able to choose one. There will be one out there for you. Great. And so the purpose of having one of those tools and choosing one and not choosing again, being mindful of like not using too many, because again, then it becomes like, well, what do I log into to talk to my team? Do I email? Do I send a chat message? Do I do a call? Do I do Zoom? You know, just stipulating those um, procedures can make it really clear for your team. So for us, we use Basecamp for the majority right. of our communications. We use email very, very infrequently. Um, and so basically, if we're going to use Basecamp as an example, you'll have different places where you check in, in, the, in the, at the start of the day and you say good morning and good, you know, whatever, whatever time of day it is right. um, for somebody else, somebody else will reply and say hi, or, you know, even emoji, just giving an emoji shows that you're acknowledging right. a message. And so Having a central place where you communicate and check in um, is very is basically sets up this expectation that look, um, you're working remotely. We're here to support you. We're here to answer yeah. your questions, make sure you're unblocked. But this is what we expect. You check in once in a day. You send an end of day report, for example. Um, you know, it depends on, on the role. The engineers might do a, a stand up. Um, yeah. Basically, just set making setting up that expectation for them and making sure they Great. follow through. Great. Now, now, somebody has an idea. Okay, these are the type of tools. And if they want, they can try in the same realm. Like uh, one thing is there, I've tried this one. Maybe there's another tool in the mm -hmm. same uh, category. I, uh, this, this will give them some idea. Because you see, India is a big country. And so many entrepreneurs are there uh, in remote areas. Now, mm -hmm. uh, in cities, a lot of people keep on knowing about things but uh, as i said there are so many things one knows but then you it just does not come to your mind when you are actually coming down to doing mm -hmm. that thing and you start using something uh, lesser that's mm -hmm. the whole idea of you know getting to know from uh, getting to have an outside perspective and especially from a place uh, from sydney so and you are already doing that work so one another question that uh, that comes to my mind in terms of uh, a team which is mostly made of remote workers is about client confidentiality. Mm -hmm. How, uh, what is the comfort level of clients you have faced about this? Or what do you think uh, if, if a client asks that, listen, your team is mostly, mostly made of remote workers, how would I be sure about that my things are, you know, willfully protected and that uh, that I can be assured of my confidentiality. How does that work with the team, mm. which is, uh, which is, which consists of a lot of remote workers? So you're saying, like a client who 
is about to engage. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, I, I'm just trying to think because, you know, in our situation as a SaaS, you know, we've got our customers. Uh, of course, there's terms of service and privacy on our on our website. Um, so we haven't really enc encountered this specific situation. But I think, you know, it's a, it's a very understandable um, concern that a client would have. And so you definitely want to address it. And whether that's in the form of an agreement that, you know, you... Right. you present and, and you sign off on it can be formalized you know in a legal set, set sense if you if that if that's how what the client expects um definitely you know as i said when you're using tools that are being shared across a remote team so using things like a password manager um can reassure the the um the client that you know access to these these documents and files and all that is going through a password manager, two-factor authentication, um, you know, Gmail, Google has a whole bunch of security around that as well. So, you know, I think there is a level of comfort because there's so many, you know, because we're so becoming so familiar with using these tools and becoming so common. Um, but I think that you should get in front of it if you if you feel that there is some reservation, some resistance, and of course, sharing documents, making sure you're on top of your security for your own files and documentation um, before, of course, bringing in anybody else or, or dealing with any client con confidential uh, work as well. So it's a valid concern, but I think it's one that, you know, can be easily overcome just from a conversation with a client and making sure that your security measures, your security with your team is, you know, is, is taken care of. Okay, great, great. You have uh, given some great insights and understanding of how these things actually work on the ground, Nicole, mm -hmm. because things talking and giving lectures are totally different on different settings. But, uh, you know, those those people, a lot of people have not seen things on the ground. That is why I wanted to talk to you about this particular topic. But an entrepreneur who has seen things from, you know, the nuts and bolts of the system of working things and that too, from being a teacher, an educator, and coming into the system, your eyes and ears are all open and you learn things like a mm -hmm. child. And that's where, you know, that's where the great learning can happen for others also. That's why all these answers, uh, I'm not looking for perfection, but I'm looking for real experience. So now let's look at things from an employee perspective or a mm -hmm. remote workers perspective. I'll ask only one question here. Sure. Uh, is that... Uh, a lot of companies are hiring, a lot of new companies, small companies, freelancers are hiring freelancers, as I said before. As a remote worker, uh, you want to work and you are a good worker. Mm -hmm. You are a skilled worker and that's why, and you have aspirations in life. You have, you want to give time to your family. That's why you have left your job and you want to earn better, but in your own manner. And you want to take care of your family. You want to take them out for vacation. That's the way you have planned out your work. And then you engage with a company which you have not heard of. How do you make sure that you are engaging with somebody uh, whom you can, you know, uh, uh, trust, whom mm. you can work with? And how do you do that? What are the questions that one should ask? How do, we, how do you ensure that you are getting paid on time? Several mm -hmm. times it may just not work and you will lose a month's, uh, month's uh, money. How does it work? And people are happy to take away your money. There are people who just simply vanish. Mm -hmm. There must be your work home, remote work who must be asking you several questions and you must be answering them and you must be thinking, okay, this is such a nice question that that person has asked. Even I don't have a problem uh, doing this uh, for them, but it will be a great uh, relationship when we do this particular thing. How does a remote worker engage uh, things in a manner or ask uh, things before he gets engaged uh, with a company? How do you see that? What is your advice to? Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, no, that's a great one. And I'm thinking back to, you know, all the candidates when we've had interviews, um, you know, giving them that opportunity to ask questions. And of course, they want to know, like, the basics. Will I be able to take sick leave? Do you, do you give holiday uh, leave? What are my working hours? Um, 
all of those things need to be stipulated and it's fine. Of course, the, the, the teammate should ask those questions so that they know what, what they're going into. And that's why I think that, uh, you know, looking for the opportunity to have that initial conversation with a potential employer is really, you know, a good move on the part of the, of the candidate because they can already get a sense of who will I be dealing with, who will I be managed by, um, all of those questions. You know, they should, you know, maybe ask for the, an organizational chart so they know, you know, how big the organization is, who they will be working with directly. Um, I think it's great when you see candidates ask what sort of upward progression or upskilling um, or career progression is offered by the, the company. And I think this is what makes remote work so attractive, especially to for both sides, actually, the employer and the employees, because a lot of those overhead costs that, you know, used to go into a building and rent and all of that can now be passed on to provide the, the employee experience um, in a way that's, you know, giving them a chance to upskill get you know access to courses uh, all of that stuff so that they can feel like they're growing and also provide things like you know do you offer many companies I know we've done this only once in the past and we're planning to do it again they may offer a retreat like an in-person uh, gathering and of course it depends on the company it could be a company that's hiring remotely and you're just in the, another state a neighboring city or a neighboring state and there's a chance to get together so I think all of those questions are really valid and the, and the teammate should ask those because uh, I think one of the things that's very attractive now is that flexibility and at the same time as that flexibility is attractive to an employee, the they still want to do, like you said, good work. They're motivated. They want to enjoy the work that they do. They want to be, be fulfilled by the work that they do. So I've, you know, we've had candidates ask, you know, who will I be working with every day? Or how often will I be talking to my manager? Um, just so that they know, like, that there's some support, there's some guidance. Will I be trained? Will there be an onboarding and training? You know, for the very first few hires, we didn't really have a very sophisticated onboarding and training process. We learned over, over the years to put something together that provided a really great way for a, a teammate to be onboarded. But that took, took some time. So I would definitely be asking if I were the, the candidate like what sort of training will I get? How long will it be for? Um, you know, when do you expect me to, to, you know, actually if it's a support team, when do I start answering real questions? When do I start working on code? All of those things. Right, Nicole, right. So let's move from the remote part of it. Okay. Now coming to webinar ninja.com. Now in terms of your work, and you see you have been an educator who decided to apply your teacher skill to set independent business building. And now you help other aspiring entrepreneurs turn their goals into reality. Uh, entrepreneurship is not a small thing, but a lot of people want to have uh, their own way of living and entrepreneurship can come very handy in that. And you don't have to build a billion dollar empire, but you can certainly build something that is enough for you and your family and can keep you happy. That's a lot about independent entrepreneurship. Tell us first about Webinar Ninja. And then how do you help this, especially teachers? You see, India, we have got huge number of teachers. And mm -hmm. many want to uh, do beyond what they are doing. How do you apply your teaching skills to actually build something bigger? And teaching is such a noble profession. But mm. everywhere in the world, it, it does not get paid the way they should be. Only in mm -hmm. some countries, people are actually, you know, teachers get paid in that same level. Yeah. So what would you tell them, uh, firstly, about your webinar, uh, webinar Ninja? And then how, what would you tell, especially teachers, how they can, you know, uh, upgrade their, uh, their level of using their same skills to make a better life of, for themselves? How does yeah. that work? That's that's a great one. And I definitely I can relate to all the teachers out there who might be looking for, you know, a, a change and a way to continue tra and transferring those excellent skills um, onto something that's a bit more independent. And that's what I think attracted um, Omar and myself to running and starting a SaaS company and starting Webinar Ninja, because we saw that potential of being able to take our knowledge, take our skills and be able to, you know, 
present it and deliver it at scale. You know, it's not like now you know, in the classroom, it's you and, you know, 30 other bodies or however many people can fit into that room. You know, with a webinar platform, when you're delivering a webinar, you can be reaching hundreds and, and thousands of people. Um, and you don't, ha as you said, you don't have to be reaching thousands of people to have a very profitable uh, business because you can have a very, um, you know, loyal audience, uh, you know, fans who are, you know, who appreciate your work and who continue to come back for more of your, whatever it is that you're teaching them, maybe you're a coach, um, you know, whatever it is that you, you're offering them. So I think that's what's very powerful about um, a web, like for example, Webinar Ninja is it's a way for people to take that expertise um, and deliver it at scale and, and build their audience. Because as soon as you start to build an audience, as soon as you start to be able to have a following, then you're much able to, to learn about their needs, the problems that they have, the things that you can solve for them. And then you're able to, you know, provide those services, provide those products, products and, and have that repeat, you know, customer base from your existing audience. So it's a very, it's a great way to be able to be, you know, independent using the things that you know. And a lot of our users, for example, are industry experts. Maybe they've written a book, they have a certain um, expertise in a field and they don't want to work for a corporation. They don't want to work for a big business. They don't want to work for a company, but they have this knowledge that, you know, they can share and in a, in a unique way, in a way that's, you know, representative of them and teach it and share it with, um, you know, with their audience. So, and I think teachers are a great example of this. You know, they have a lot of knowledge. They have a way. They're already at an advantage because they're used to presenting. They're used to communicating, breaking things down, breaking, breaking concepts down delivering courses, um, which is something you can also be able to do very soon with Webinar Ninja. A lot of people actually already do deliver their live training and, and, and charge for it using Webinar Ninja. And um, soon we'll be releasing uh, a new app, uh, which will be able to uh, allow our users to deliver live courses. Right, right. And who can use Webinar Ninja? Who is it for? And then along with that, how can people connect with you uh, so that they can make the best out of your expertise, make the best out of what you have to offer to Webinar Ninja. Sure. So as I mentioned, you might be... Also about your podcast, how they can listen to your podcast. <laughs> sure. Um, so with, so for, for example, as I mentioned, a lot of our users might be um, they're experts in a field. They might have written a book, so they could be an author, they could be a speaker, or they could be a coach, and they have certain knowledge. They could be a trainer, a consultant, um, and they have this knowledge, and they want to share it and th so they can get started You know, running live webinars, attracting leads, building up their email list. So, you know, Webinar Ninja is designed for, you know, we up starting price is $29 a, a month. So it is designed for very small teams and of course can scale with, with bigger teams. So if anyone is looking to, you know, and is interested in running a webinar, they can head over to webinarninja.com and they can, you know, start a free trial. We have a free trial as well. Um, and they can check out the software and see if it suits their needs. And, you know, as they're building the business, you know, Omer and I, our passion has been teaching, has been the, uh, the foundation of our businesses has been through teaching and, and creating content. So the $100 MBA show has now published over 2000 episodes. So there is a very extensive library of lessons that really can give you all those tips. A lot of the questions that you asked today, which was so great, AJ, about managing a team, hiring your first employee, firing someone you know nobody wants to do it but you have to do it and so we've got lessons on uh, all of that at the hundred dollar mba show so that any podcast app you can look up the hundred dollar mba show there as well and how do they connect with you so my favorite look they can go to the website and they can they can um you know, reach out to our team and, you know, we can get in touch. My favorite, um, you know, t social media app would be um, Instagram. So I'm at Nicole Baldinu on Instagram. So I'd love to have, you know, anyone reach out who got some value from this, from our, our conversation today. I'd love to say hello and, and see what they learned. Right. Right, Nicole. I, I think it, it, it's become a valuable podcast for me also because there's so much of insight. As I said, uh, in theory, everything uh, sounds so good. There can be hundreds of lectures on remote working, especially mm -hmm. so many experts have just cropped up uh, after uh, during COVID. And now they are 
uh, some very val valuable experts, uh, but I don't want to always talk to them. I would like to talk to people on the ground and get it straight away from the ground who have who has experienced it all and built it all. Okay, that's great. So thank you very much for your time. With this, it's a wrap on this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass live from the guest Nicole Baljinu from Sydney, Australia. Thank you once again. Thank you, AJ. Had a great time.